From Hollywood, California, welcome to Razor Riffs with your host, Keith Razor. All right. Hey, Danny. Good to meet you, man. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so much. I, I'm glad I'm we good. finally got this. How's the sound on your end? Is it okay in here? It sounds great. Sounds great. Nice and clear. All right. Because it's a, I'm in a, I'm in a, in my building, there's this uh, conference room. I was in the lounge, but the, too many people started coming in. So I didn't want to, so I'm isolated now. Oh, and okay. We won't be disturbed. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know you're busy filming and uh, you're on the other side yeah. of the world. So thank you so much. It really <laughs> means a lot to me. And uh, I'm glad we finally got to do this. It's good to meet you, man. Yeah. Good to meet you. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, talk to you about this starting off because when I when I told people I was going to interview you, because I'm a stand up comic, yeah. a lot of people said that you used to do stand up, like in OC where yeah, I'm I, from. I, in OC, mm, yeah, I've been down there a couple of times. I mean, I've been to Tustin. I've been to a couple of places down there, but my base was in LA mostly. Yeah. And I've done some New York clubs as well. And I did some road gigs over the years. Yeah. yeah. Are we are you recording now or not? Yeah, yet? yeah. No, no. Oh, you are. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was, I was, all right, just jump right in. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh but I think that's awesome, man. Like uh so w when did you start uh stand up? Was this before you started getting into acting or well I, I studied acting at uh well, I studied film and theater at Temple University back in the end of the 80s uh, after high school. Um, and then uh, did some theater, some some live theater. I was in an improv troupe for a while. And then um, I did a, two shows in New York uh, off, off, off Broadway. <laughs> and then um, moved to Los Angeles at the end of 89 and uh, started stand up uh just three months later essentially oh, that's yeah. awesome yeah i uh because i february, I, february 19 1990 was my first time on stage oh nice and i did yeah. it for many many years and i still do it from time to time i mean i'll, I'll host a show or whatever and um I, I probably the last time i did it was before the pandemic at some point i probably the last time i did it Oh, but I'm not. A... I, I I was never really a road comic per se. I mean, I did a couple of road gigs, but once I started to land, you know, film and television work, I didn't want to leave. You know, I didn't want to leave town. Yeah. <laughs> Even if the jobs were sometimes few and far between, I still was like, I got to be available to audition and to get opportunities. So that's why I didn't become like a a road warrior, as they say. Yeah. Well, hey, if I ever become like a very, very famous uh, headlining comic, I want to take you on the road and then we could just do stand up together. Okay. I think I think that would be fun. But um, so I got into stand up because I have a form of autism called Asperger's syndrome. And uh, it really like because uh, I was very nonverbal and it right. really it really helped me get verbal. So like I thought like stand up really saved my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so that's how I got into it. And then, uh, you know, I think a lot of stand-ups go into stand-up to then do acting. So that's why I was curious about you, is like if you got the stand no, was, and you're like... There yeah. were essentially two dreams that I was pursuing. And yeah. one, one wasn't for the purposes of the other. Although I will say stand-up, performing stand-up definitely gave me the cojones to audition with less and less fear because, you know, there's a difference between going in with scripted material and, you know, flying by the seat of your pants on stage. Right. So yeah, you get, you get really confident after being on stage doing stand up. So I think it definitely boosted my audition ability. Yeah. It, speaking of auditions, they, they always say like, uh, well, I don't know if this is like an accurate version, but they always say you get like a hundred no's before you get one. Yes. I wanted to know if that's true. Where, when was your first yes? And do you remember that feeling that you got it? Yeah. Um, I think for someone like me to get a hundred auditions, period, <laughs> it's not. So it's like you need, if you're, if you're a person with disability or in my case, 
a person with dwarfism and you fit a specific niche, um, the chances of you getting a hundred auditions in the span of like a year or two years. Very slim. Yeah. Slim. So you need to have a really high book ratio. And I, I did early on, I had a high book ratio. So I did not go through a hundred notes. I will say, I can't remember how many no's I went through before getting a yes, but it wasn't long. <laughs> yeah. Like um, I had been in LA a year and I booked a uh, uh, audition for an episode of Hunter and I booked that um, as a guest spot. And I felt like that came quick. I can't remember how many other auditions I might've been on, but I was kind of the new kid in town when it came to auditioning little people. So I think that helped me because nobody had seen me before. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I will say my beard helped me too. <laughs> it gave me, a, it gave me more gravitas possibly than I was expecting. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I did a guest spot on Hunter in, uh, I guess it would have been 90, end of 1990. Yeah. So like within a year, I would say of being in LA, I booked a guest starring role. Oh, that's awesome. That That's uh. <laughs> Yeah, I've been trying to do acting my whole career. I've only done one movie, and I was just offered that because of my stand-up. And then after yeah. I fil filmed it, they're like, I think we made a mistake. <laughs> well, that's what they said. Yeah. They, they actually said that to you? Uh, if you see the movie, Danny, you'll be like, yeah, they're right. <laughs> well, let me ask you. I mean, if that's your dream, do you study it? Do you pursue it do you yeah educate yourself yeah I, I do study acting i took a couple classes at a south coast repertory okay. and and then i went to the groundlings to learn the improv you know yeah. side of it and then there's an actor named jake weber who's one of my favorite actors and he's like kind of like he's like Wait, a guy young, who, young jake weber like, no no jake he's all not, the way jake all the way jake weber no no he was on medium jake weber He's like a. Oh. He's Who very. Am I of? Jake, what is that boy's name? From Jingle All the Way. Uh, yeah, Jake. I don't know, but I could. Maybe it's not Weber. Okay. Yes, I know Jake Weber. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, and I think he's fantastic. So he he does these Zoom acting things that I like a master class thing. Yeah. That I that I got, and so I've been watching that and stuff, so like that. But like, no, I mean, I'm not like. A great actor but so like that's what are you in a zoom you could get theory but yeah you can't really perform in that yeah yeah so that's yeah, what i'm saying yeah. yeah you need to perform in a class and be critiqued yeah you, know? you need to be picked apart i do yeah yeah i just, mean that's that's the thing they get, you need to be broken down in a class situation yeah and they just you like know? rip you down and you're like uh it's yeah, kind of like they, they they pick you apart and then they, they help you find what you need to find in the scene. You know, yeah. do you think that acting uh, is because it's kind of like one of those like where they say, hey, uh, you can't really teach stand up comedy, but you could teach uh, tricks to do it. Do you think yeah. acting is the same way? Um, Yeah, I mean, you learn technique. You know, yeah. I used to coach comedy as well. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I did a lot of coaching because I found I have found in this business, a lot of people started to sound the same. And so I can, I could give a comic like one note. If they, yeah. if they do this one thing that I think is bad, I can give them one note that will change everything about their comedy. Yeah. And that's, that note is this. Um, when you do your setups, don't form them into a question. Oh yeah. Don't, that's a great note. Yeah. Don't put that lilt in your voice. Like you don't know where you're headed. You hear that? You know, yeah. everything sounds like a question. Yeah. Like the other day I was out. You know, that was my girlfriend. <laughs> you know, it just it just totally weakens you and it takes away your attitude. And so that's that's always been my note to sort of get people off of that track. And then, you know, working with people on their material and helping them find, you know, better punches and, and you know, that sort of thing. But I did that for quite a while, actually, at a couple of them, um, a couple of students in that that. Maybe didn't go on to do stand up so much, um, but uh, I worked with uh, Kevin Skeeney, who uh, did stand up for a while. But I think he 
is more of a writer. And now he writes for, um, he writes all the roast stuff on Comedy Central. Yeah. Yeah. So he was one of my students. Um, ben Giroux, who's a voiceover actor, he was one of my students. Uh, he's an actor and a voiceover actor. Uh, so, yeah, I, I've guided a few a few folks in, in this realm. Yeah. Uh, over the years i haven't i haven't coached in a long time but if, if anybody wanted me to coach them i don't know i don't think you could pay me enough at this point to to to, to bear that but um my one note would be that i mean i could you watch half the comics that are on stage nowadays and they all have that question mark in the in all their setups and it drives me nuts it's yeah. like a L, la speak you know well they also do that uh, that type of humor on a lot of sitcoms too yeah but i think yeah. sitcoms you could get away with that because it's yeah but you, it, it's still it's still so much stronger if you don't do that yeah it still makes the it still makes whatever the setup is so much strong yeah if you if you put put the attitude spin on it. yeah you know? but so, people i mean people have a tendency to talk that way all the time i hear broadcasters talking that way you know news broadcasters it's just disturbing to me yeah because you sound like everybody else, everybody else who doesn't know what the hell they're doing. It, it is kind of funny when the sports people do it, because then it's like um, they probably know nothing about the sport. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. yeah, yeah. I just think it's kind of funny when they do it. But I wanted to talk about sitcoms because uh, we texted a little and you told me uh, you worked with the. Uh, my former best friend who is no longer with us, uh, Norm McDonald. And I wanted to know, how is that yeah. like? Yeah. No, I, I didn't. I mean, I knew Norm was a good comic. I didn't know that the sitcom was his strong suit. Um, you know, he had a, he had a rhythm. He had a rhythm that for me as an actor was like, I don't know what the hell he's saying. You know what I mean? <laughs> he, he had such a peculiar rhythm to his delivery, um, even as a sitcom performer. Uh, he was inherently norm, of course. Uh, but I was like, I don't, I, I can't even understand him. You know, like it was like a, it was just sort of like a, I mean, you know him, right? You knew him, so there was sort of a mumbling kind of a, of a way that he had of delivering his stuff. You know, yeah, you know what I mean when you're talking about a guy. You know, he said that sort of. I'm like, what, what did I just miss there? I didn't, you know. So unless the camera's really focused on him and you. You know, somebody in the sound department can clean up what he's saying. Um, I, I always found him peculiar that way. Uh, but I had a great time working on that episode. It was a lot of fun. Um, they, it was an interesting thing because as an actor, a lot of times if you're on a sitcom, unless you have, unless you have some clout, you have some stuff under your belt, you're a little bit recognizable. You know, sometimes the director will tell you exactly what you need to do. Mm -hmm. and not give you any any leeway to play you know um so it's always important for me to get that opportunity to to play in uh in the space because you know things develop all the time uh so once you go from the audition room and you get into the you get onto the stage and you go to rehearsals you know things are developing and you want to be able to have the freedom to find those beats you know if you come in as a guest star you get a little more leeway on that if you come in in a co-star you have you know, less than five lines. Uh, a lot of times, the directors and the showrunners will tell you, "This is how you're going to do it." You know. Yeah. So there's, I know I had, I know I had some of that leeway on that show, because I added them. I don't know if you saw the episode, but it was a, it was a bit where I was refusing to play a Christmas elf, or something like that, because I, I was like, we're well, going into the unemployment office, and I, I felt it was dehumanizing kind of a thing, and it was a whole bit about. You know, trying to keep the small man down. That was my line. You know, right. They try to keep the small man down, you know. <laughs> um, and I do it like a it's like a, a protest, you know. Um, and it was like a line I added, so they let that go, you know what I mean? So when I get to add a line or something like that, um, or add a whole full on characterization, um it's always good when the director goes, Oh, okay, yeah, I see where he's going. I'll let that go because it's good, you know. And, and I that, think that comes with that comes with having a body of work that's recognizable that people go, this guy knows what he's doing. He's gonna, you know, he's gonna get us there okay, whatever, you know. And but it's also like uh because 
I don't know nowadays if sitcoms or stuff are filmed in front of a live audience, but back then those were live audiences. So sure, yeah, all so I, you could explain, you could like do yeah, different I, takes. I would say most of the sitcoms I've done have been in front of a live audience. There's been a couple of kids shows that we had like paid paid laughers. You know what I mean? Yeah. They come in and they they're like extras. They come in for the day while you're shooting and they they watch you know on monitor and you know, add their laughter to the, to the track, you know, but it wasn't, um, uh, the single camera, obviously single camera has no audience, you know, like modern family, there's no audience there. Uh, but, um, all the, all the four cameras stuff, uh, the last one I did was, um, the neighborhood, uh, that that's all usually live audience, but thinking about that, no, we had a, we had a paid audience because it was still COVID. Oh really? Episode, yeah. So we had a we had a, a few people pegged in the in the bleachers, but no no full on audience because of COVID. Yeah. Well, would, would, would do you think that would have been like uh, because I understand COVID and like the rules and regulations, but do you think that like that like kind of hurts the laugh track if they're all social distancing because it's not a power more, more well, powerful? They, laugh. I mean, they they take they take good laughers, right? So laughers okay. get paid because they have. They have a certain quality to their laugh, so they they're known to to do these to do these audience things. They come in, they're going to laugh, they're going to have a good laugh. It's going to sound natural or strange or unusual, and then they'll lay those other laughs over top of you know some other kind of laugh track. You know, okay, yeah. So the, it's a it's a mixing job for post. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't I don't think there's any problem necessarily with that uh, because they'll always be able to get a track, even if they. Even if a joke doesn't land, they'll still sweeten the track, you know. Yeah, it's it's kind of like uh, whenever I do stand up comedy, I always pray Emilio Estevez is in the audience because his laugh is just so you know what I mean. So like, oh, yeah, <laughs> he has a weird laugh. No, it's just so great because you could just oh, it, it, it's like one of those laughs where like you don't stop laughing until like two minutes, and I don't know, I just feel like that those are the best type of laughs. So. Yeah, but um, I wanted to ask you about Death to Smoochie, which is one of my top favorite comedy films in the world. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it, it's it's a dark comedy, and I wanted to ask you like when you read the script and you read the tone like how did you like did you know that vision that was how the direction they were going or well i mean i i, I trusted danny danny devito the director i trusted him i knew his style you know i knew yeah. his you know dark comedy war of the roses matilda is a, is a comedy but it's also dark you know so i knew his his style um but uh I saw the funny in all of it, you know, yeah. I saw the funny in all of it. And it was of course more to it once we got into it, you know, because working with Robin has to be the treat of my career thus far. Uh, and I got to the point in working with him where, you know, Danny would give direction and then say, all right, Robin, do one for you, you know, which yeah. meant he was going to go and do his thing. And, you know, uh, and then we reached a point when he would say that to Robin and then he would say, all right, Danny, do one for you, which would give me an opportunity to play as well. Um, and uh, I remember one of the lines that I I popped up um, <laughs> in one of those beats was uh, the line when I'm caught and I'm calling him on the phone and I'm all tied up and yeah. I'm talking about, you know, buggy, you know, buggy, buggy ding dong. Is that his name? Buggy <laughs> ding dong. And I, Vincent Chiavelli. And I say, he was jacked up higher than a prom dress in June. That was that was the line that I came up with, and they they left it in. So, <laughs> uh, well, what was the the singing uh, state the singing films like? Because uh, like that, I've never seen anyone film a singing song. So, like, I don't I know how like when you do different takes, but like, is the singing yeah. stuff is that like the same way or do they go to a studio and sing the song and then just do the dance? No, it, it depends. I mean, it really depends. Um, in this case, probably depends on the budget because when we sang on the stage, I don't think, God, it's just, you know, 23 years ago now. I don't think I ever went to studio to sing. Okay. I think I just did everything on stage. So they had enough coverage and sound for like the, 
the Santa Buddies and Santa Paws and Santa Pups where we sing in those, you know, kids movies, we would go to studio and do the song. Yeah. And uh, for I know for Mirror Mirror as well, we went into studio to sing a song. Um, so I think it just depends. It just depends. Yeah. Danny just left it as far as I can remember, just that we would do the singing uh, on the stage. Yeah. And then you, you brought up Mirror Mirror, uh, that movie. Uh, I haven't seen in a long time, so I apologize. I don't remember if he had any scenes, but Nathan Lane was in it. And Nathan yeah. Lane is, is a fantastic actor. And I was just wondering, like, what was that like? Like, did your pass ever cross with him? Yeah, we, we have a scene. We did have a scene with him. Um, it's a scene where he's escaping in a carriage and the carriage overturns. And I just remember, you know, the scene has all the, the of the seven dwarf characters pop their head into the carriage to speak to him. And he could not get through the scene because every time we all popped our heads and he just broke down laughing yeah. like every single time. <laughs> so he could not get through a scene. And um, he did sit with us a, a few a few days and, in, in, you know, off off soundstage, just kind of chatting and having a good time. Uh, he's a very funny, funny guy, very talented, obviously. Um, but we had a good time with him. Yeah. Yeah. So when you work with all these, uh, actors and, you know, like you worked with everybody do when, after you you film something, do you like think, okay, I learned this from that. So like, I'll put that in my next project. Like, is that how your mind works when you're getting into these roles? Um, I think just in terms of in terms of directing you know i mean i learned a lot watching directors work obviously over the years i mean you know i had four years of college studying film and studying theater and you know to to be on a stage you know for a couple of months is like a huge learning experience yeah you, know, you sort of learn learn how the, the sausage is made as it were much more so than when you're in school sort of studying theory and understanding all of that. You're yeah. seeing how all of this plays out. And now with technology, you know, a director can just use his iPhone and pop on a pop on a lens, you know, like use an app to pop on a, a certain size lens and then frame frame the shot and then yeah. decide, you know, which which lens is going to look the best. Like in two seconds they can do that. It's just a remarkable difference from when I when I first started. I mean, obviously, you can see what a Enterprise. what a lens is going to look like, but Enterprise. it's Come just um, Whoa! It's, <laughs> the, the, yes, my that's my text. Kirk <laughs> Enterprise, my text. Uh, all right. <laughs> I I want to respect your time. Are we good on time? <laughs> yeah, we got another about twenty minutes, fifteen twenty minutes. We're good. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was like Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm an old Shatner fan. Um, Star Trek original. In fact, uh, in uh, the episode, um, the Seinfeld episode where we do the diseases mm -hmm. in the for the medical school students, yeah, uh, Mickey has this line: "Why did I drink for all those years? Why did I look for love in a bottle?" That's me doing a William Shatner impression yeah. <laughs> solely for, solely for the purpose of making Jason Alexander laugh because he was such a Star Trek original series Shatner fan. Yeah, so I threw it. I actually threw it into the show itself. So um, that's what you see in that moment. <laughs> I'm doing that Shatner moves, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, isn't it crazy how big Seinfeld is? Because I'm sure like everybody knows you from Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Especially, if, you know, it's funny. It's like in certain parts of New York, when I'm in New York, there are certain parts where they know me more. So if I'm on the Upper East Side, yeah. I can't walk two blocks without somebody stopping me, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, other parts, if I'm down, like in, in Chelsea or in the village, I, I don't get recognized as much. It's very strange. Like uh, you can almost say like, Oh, these guys had it on every night of the week. You know what I mean? And they're still watching, you know, yeah. uh, that that's all on the upper East, you know, up above, up above 60th, uh, around third, <laughs> My anywhere in that area. My uncle was on Seinfeld for a couple episodes when he was a struggling actor. Oh, and that, that? Uh, Patrick Warburton. And then when Patrick is your uncle. Yeah. And then I didn't know that. Yeah. And then um, when 
It, so like he was struggling when he was, he was on Seinfeld, but everyone knew him from Seinfeld. And right. I feel he, I feel he really hit mainstream with rules of engagement because that was his show. Oh, yeah, you know, totally, totally. I so, mean, he he his career launched after that. Plus, he got the he got the Superman commercials as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, he 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 really took off, and the, and the Putty character is great. We did we did two episodes together that I for sure that I remember. Um, yeah, I think he's in the Yada Yada with me. He. Uh, that's when he's um going to hell he says yeah. you're going to hell i think that's the episode it doesn't, doesn't about me because you're going to hell i just yeah. love the way he speaks feels like an arby's night you know yeah. <laughs> that characterization that he created is just so great he's like go devils or yeah you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> devils devils <laughs> uh but the, uh i want also wanted to ask you about jingle all the way which yeah. i think was a fantastic uh movie uh, because you got to work with uh, Jim Belushi, and Jim I think Belushi, Arnold Schwarzenegger, though I mean that's yeah, that is a presence on on screen. You know, the, the, this is what I learned watching Arnold. There's when you are at, at a certain level in this industry, you want to be like the captain of the ship on set, right? right? And so he had that, you know, he had that kind of magnetism, and I learned that like you want to present yourself as an authority, as a, as a figure to pay attention to, you know, um, somebody with knowledge. And I mean, after 30, how many years now? 30, 34 years in this business, <laughs> 34 years in this business. I've been doing this longer than I, than I haven't been, um, yeah. which is kind of a milestone in and of itself. But I, I just learned a lot from watching him, you know, take command of a room you know, even with even with Jim in the room, right? Yeah. The because Jim is that kind of guy too, you know. And uh but I I I, I connected definitely definitely with um Arnold. And then Jim and I were gonna do another another show together with the, the same director. That that never that never uh came to fruition. We we went to a table reading and we were sort of you know rehearsing but we never actually got to do the other film. Um but the director was going to put Jim and I back together. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. It would have been fun. It would have been fun to revisit that, that relationship. Does, does a lot of pro uh, projects, uh, I don't know. We were talking about the one versus a hundred theory. Uh, yeah. Do, do a lot of projects go into like, they get green lighted or whatever, and then they just get into development. Hell or like, how does that work? Um, I, I think I've only, in all of my bookings, there's only been about two or three projects that never manifested, yeah. you know. Um, uh, I, I remember I booked I booked that um, Dabney Coleman series, Madman of the People. Okay. And uh, I booked it, and I was going to work, and then they canceled the show before I actually got to go to work. Yeah, um, which is very, it's, it's, it was kind of, you know, it was certainly a bummer, but because I booked the show, they booked me as a union actor, they had to pay me. So even though I never did it, I did get a check for that show. Oh, I would have much awesome. rather done it because I would have much rather worked with Dad Nicole. Same was true with um, Bad Santa. I had, uh, I had an excellent lawyer at the time and it was down to uh, me and uh, Tony Cox. Yeah, and we screen tested with uh, Bernie Mac and Billy Bob Thornton. Um, so that's so funny because uh, working with uh, Billy Bob, you know, it was a very casual meeting. You know, we sort of rehearsing in a small room, no bigger than like ten by twelve. You know, it was a small, intimate space. And we rehearsed together. We read the lines and worked together. But he's sitting there. He's got a can of beer and he's smoking a cigarette, and he goes. He goes, I hope you don't mind, but I smoke and I drink. Yeah. And I said, I hope I hope you don't mind, but I burp and I fart. <laughs> <laughs> so so I wanted to sort of, you know, put him at ease at the same time, but also say, you know, you're not the only guy with, with vices, buddy. <laughs> um, but, um, but I didn't get that role. Tony went to Tony, who did a fantastic job. But um, because I had a good lawyer at the time, I'm, I got... 
essentially work from being in those things. So from being in those screen tests. So I effectively still collect money from bad Santa when it runs. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It's one of those magical things that happens every now and then. Like you don't get the job, but we did pay you something and you always. <laughs> so it's either a good reminder or a reminder that I didn't get the job because I get another check for $27. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know a uh, bad Santa three, you know, if they ever do it, you know, they might. Nah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I went, I went to the reading of bad Santa too. And I, I should have known better then. <laughs> but so like that, that's an interesting thing about sequels too, because uh, you were in Ninja Turtles, which I loved. And I thought like, yeah. it was because the 1990s, what 91 was great, but I thought the, this one was a good remake of 2014. It, you know? yeah. yeah. And then yeah. what you didn't do the sequel. So did you turn that down? Or I didn't did do I... the sequel. No, I didn't turn it down. I think they figured, they figured, um, you know, so much of the, so much of the ninja work was done by the uh, stunt guys, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm here and there throughout those sequences when we're close up for the, for the fights and we're close up and I have to speak. Um, but uh, that's one of those shows where I don't think, I don't think the director and I meshed as well. Mm -hmm. Um you know, he 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 didn't somehow he didn't communicate something that he needed from me. And I obviously never gave him that. So I don't I think I, I just didn't go back for for whatever reason. Uh but not because I turned it down, it just didn't come my way. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, communication is a big part of uh business yeah. and life. You know, some directors, some directors are really technical, you know, and they'll get into all the technical stuff, but don't forget to talk to the actors about what they need. Yeah. Right? So the whole time I'm doing the show, you know, uh, compliments left and right from all the producers and everything's great. And, and then uh, somewhere along the line, they, uh, they, they came in and they replaced my voice with, um, um, uh, Monk. What is his name? My name just escapes me now. Uh, uh, you know, from Monk. Okay, I I'm. I'm about. Yeah, maybe if I see the face, but yeah, I don't. Yeah, well, Danny, okay. I, I have three more questions, and I'll, yeah. I'll, you, know, you know, we could just, if you want to, just answer these very fast. That's fine. Uh, sure. so, so I wanted to ask you when, when, for, for example, I'm sure there's been other stuff you've done that had this problem, but when you did Seinfeld. I remember one of the episodes, uh, Jason Alexander, and I think maybe in the script, you know, he, yeah. he uses, he uses the, the M word, the M yeah. word. Yeah, of and course. I, and I wanted to know, like, how, how, you know, there's a way to, to like, that's that I'll just jump to it. That's been an obstacle throughout my career. You know, uh -huh. um, it, it always amazes me how much I have to explain to people about how derogatory it is. Um, and, you know, this was 1990. Three, right. Uh, de December of ninety three is when I was shooting. It aired February, I think, of ninety four. But we shot December of ninety three, so this is, you know, thirty one years ago. Uh, and um, uh, I said to Larry and Jerry, you know, I had done like a little speech, like a little impromptu speech about the word in the room, and they got sort of cringy about it. Um, and they said, "Well, you know, look, here's here's the thing. For me, I can't let the word go." Like, I can't just let it land and ignore it. Right. That's, it's offensive. And so somehow Mickey needs to address that. And so, we, you know, because they never had a very special episode of Seinfeld where, you know, lessons are learned, we, they, their whole idea was to teach the lesson a different way You through the comedy, which developed into Mickey turning on, on George and making an approach like he's going to rip his head off yeah. and then correcting him. And then Michael... Uh, Michael Richards improvises the line, easy, Mickey, easy. <laughs> and so from, the, from those two beads is born Mickey Abbott, the volatile, ready to beat the crap out of you character that he became. And so um, in, in addressing the issue that was difficult for me, we made a whole character, you know? Yeah. And I have, I have been in front of very famous producers 
who will never deviate from their script, from their words, because it's the gospel. Um, and been disappointed by that and not gotten jobs because of that, because I would object and say, you know, you can't say this. And like, even in Watchmen, you know, in the, in the original book, they refer to a uh, big figure as a midget. And um, I said, you know, in, before I took the job, I said, it can't appear anywhere in the script where I'm not there mm -hmm. and I can't address it. So if it's going to be in the script, big figure has to address it. Right. right. Like has to either kill someone or bring them down. You know what I mean? I don't know if you've seen Watchmen, but yeah. um, he has to address it. And that's always been my thing. If you're going to use the word, it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be addressed by me. Otherwise, don't put it in the script. And it can't just be bandied about casually. And I've had so many scripts come across my path where it's there all the time. And I'm like, no, no. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I worked on this play. I did a read through of this play and the play is called Killer Midgets. And it's a great play. But I said, you know, I'll do the play, but you got to change the title if this ever goes. Right. Because I want people to understand that this, you can't, you know. And I think the guy was so locked up in what he thought was fine that the play never went, you know. He didn't realize it's just not going to go. So I've addressed it in many, many shows. And I've addressed this sort of dehumanizing attitude towards little people or this pathos around little people being ashamed of themselves because they're small. Right. But it's not that. It's not that at all. It's... It's our objection to society's perception, right? Not that they, they always in a script will make us internalize the shame that we're at fault in a sense, as opposed to society is the ones at fault because of how they see us, and how they treat us, right? So that's that's the whole, those are the two different worlds that oh, I've lived yeah. in with, with producers over the years. Hmm. Definitely. I mean, uh, I've, I've been able to change scripts many, many times. I, I've been able to, like, in Bones, there was a lot of uh, misconceptions about the medical aspects of dwarfism. And so when I did the Bones episodes, I talked to them about that. Um, we did a whole diatribe on uh, dwarfs in art that was in that and how we were seen as pets Yeah. You know, um, in, in early art, you know, the pets of royalty, essentially. And... Um, I did a, a, a one of those jiggle shows in the '90s called Silk Stockings, and um, there was a whole pathos around my character being a killer because he was ashamed of his size. And I thought this is not what this is about. It's about that his wife is out with other men. Yeah, and he's pretending he's being cuckolded, and he's pretending that it's okay. And he's you know he's not ashamed about his size. He's he's distraught that his wife is screwing around. You know. Oh yeah. And, he, and he has to hide it. You know. Um, which makes him essentially a killer. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, the, the, these are ways that I've changed shows. But at the same time, I've, I've come in to try to change a show where they made, uh, it was a kid's show, and they made the little person in it. Essentially, he's constantly hitting on a, like a 14-year-old girl, like right. or 15 years, 14 or 15 years old. He's trying to kiss her all the time. And he's sort of making googly eyes. And I said, this is a kid's show, right? It's like a kid sitcom. And they go, yeah. And I said, but you've essentially made my character a pedophile and try to make it funny, you know? Right. Um, so they just didn't bother hiring me. Rather than see that for what it is, they thought, well, we're not going to deviate from that. We think it's funny that the old man dwarf is trying to make out with a 15-year-old. So I was like, mm, it's not for me then. This is not for me. That was, that was a good choice, you know, because yeah. that that's like coming into light now with that quiet on set documentaries and stuff. Right, so, right, right. You know, so, so last thing I needed is any kind of film footage of me trying to make it with a child. I know. It's yeah. disturbing. And no, it's certainly not an image I would want to put out there at all anyway. No, definitely. But I totally understand because, you know, uh, even in stand up comedy, you know, when they use the R war word to be funny, I find yeah. it very, very offensive because I'm right. not I'm not that I'm at, you know what I mean? So I feel like I also feel that there I also so I don't like mean to play devil's advocate, but I also feel a lot of people don't understand what they don't know. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I, but I think nowadays people know it, and they oh just no no use yeah it yeah it anyway right yeah so like people know that the M word is offensive they know that that the R word is offensive I mean John Mulaney he's on my list because he did a whole diatribe um, in his comedy about the that it's not offensive that the M word is not offensive because little people will say it's sort of like the N word and he'll say no it's not you know. Um, and as a result, they used it, you know, time and time again on Saturday Night Live from his writing, you know. So they put it in a, many, many scripts. It was with, um, uh, you know, the guy who would come on, uh, Bill Hader, would come on and play this this sort of effeminate character who talked about going to these clubs. And, and, and there was always, you know, sort of slang, different slang. Yeah, uh, for all the people that came to the club, and um, he would always sort of break and laugh during this, and he was very funny doing it. But the end of every single one of them was a midget reference. Every single one of them had that, and his belief system. He argued with the network, said it's not offensive, and I'm like, who, who the fuck is he to decide if it's not offensive? You yeah, know? it's punching it, down, not so like that's yeah. the, the, that's the problem. So yeah. And then uh, my two final questions. Uh, this one is uh, like a philosophy question. If you could go into a time machine and talk to a younger version of yourself, telling you what you know now and what you've learned in your life, it could be from yesterday or it could be from when you were a child. What advice would you give yourself? Uh, have more confidence, be more fearless. Yeah. You know, um, those choices that you wanted to make, but didn't make them. Yeah. That's good advice. I'm so glad you yeah. said that. And you didn't say, Danny, uh, if Keith Reza asks you to do his podcast, say no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, your last question. <laughs> my final question is, uh, where can the folks at home follow and support you? Oh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, Danny Woodburn on Instagram. Um, I have a website that needs to be re redone. Uh, but, you know, Instagram, uh, I don't really do much of the Twittering anymore. Yeah. So, and um, I'm currently working on uh, The Witcher here in London. Oh, that's awesome. Do, so, you, when, do you have a cameo? People can get little cameos from you? You want to? Yes, I'm also on cameo. People can get a cameo from me as well. Uh, awesome. Well, Danny, thank you so much for doing this. It was good to meet you, and it was Likewise. good to good to talk to you. And uh, if you're too. if you're ever in LA, you know, let's do stand up together. Okay, brother. All, All right. right, take care. I'll Have a great you. day, pal. All right, guys, that was an interview uh, with Danny Woodburn. Subscribe, rate, review, and we'll see you guys next week on the Razor Rips. Have a good day.